Prologue. And I saw a man who was a soldier. He did not wear good armor, but a strange red coat. He had been sent to India in the service of a great queen, a queen of 40 lands or more. He was very pale except where the sun had burned him. I saw him come to the place where the great river meets the ocean, the great moat that rings all the world. The waters had flowed, and the tide had turned for more than 2,000 seasons from the time of what he searched for, so that the bed of the river had moved. Often he despaired as he toiled on the shore, far from his own land. But then he found a place where the shells of oysters were piled up in the earth, marked where men had opened them long ago, broken pots and other refuse. In that land, all the gods forbid the eating of shellfish, and for untold ages have said it is an abomination, like unto the laws of the strange Hebrew god who has no family. So the man knew that people from the far west had been there long ago. The man's heart was fast in his chest. He was full of joy. Finally, he found broken blocks of stone, and then the final proof, a golden coin marked with the great king's face, the lion headdress and the horns of Ammon on his head. The man had succeeded in his quest, a quest that had driven him since childhood's hour, but he never knew the true and terrible story I will now relate. Book 20 of the Book of Marcian. 1. General Seleucus was not a happy man. His bad mood had put him in a reflective frame of mind that was unusual for him. Normally, he was a combination of immediate, practical, raw action and courage mixed with what others sometimes privately thought of as low cunning, but what he himself called my good common sense. So he had drawn apart from the others and walked away along the high cliffs. He now stood alone gazing out at the ocean. On his left and far below, Further up the coast were the huge, many-mouthed estuaries of the mighty river Indus poured out into mother of salt waters. All was a hive of activity. He could hear and observe the labor of tens of thousands of men working on the vast new harbor and fortress. Hundreds of new ships were being made to be commanded by Admiral Nertius for his proposed exploration of the ocean coast. Yet another new city was rising, all of this being done on the orders of one man. Currently, that very man was standing a few dozen yards away on Seleucus's right. Alexander also stood alone. A small knot of the inner circle of companion staff officers grouped respectfully behind him on the king's right-hand side. He was clad in a simple undecorated linen robe, the plain gold circlet he wore on his head, the only outward indication of rank. Hands clasped behind his back, his head turned slightly and tilted to the left, a posture typical for him. His majesty had now recovered sufficiently from the arrow wound in his chest that he no longer had to lean on a staff. Before this tableau of figures, in a huge recently made clearing carved from verdant jungle, activity just as frantic as below, albeit on a vastly smaller scale. Dozens of savants and artisans, mainly from the southern Greek mainland cities in Egypt, but also Persia, many other places. Included in the throng several Persian magi and even learned Indians from the newest conquests. Occasionally, newcomers would arrive and hasten forwards to abase themselves before the king. The Asiatic ones genuflecting to Alexander with the unstudied ease many of their ancestors would one day focus in another direction. The Greeks awkwardly, in a few cases with barely disguised resentment. As one Persian wit had recently said, like chickens pretending they can fly. Hundreds of slaves labored and added to the noise. There he stands, thought Seleucus, and wherever he stands is in that moment the center of the world and all the opportunities and honor that brings. So why is he sending me away? What have I done? The general turned away in disgust, as much at what he perceived as his own unwanted weakness as anything else. He stared out at the water, but as always he was sharply aware of his surroundings. From the corner of his eye saw the king make a small gesture. One of the staff officers came and stood beside him. Seleucus didn't have to look any closer to tell who it was likely to be. He smiled a small, strange, almost imperceptible smile. The officer was now walking in his direction. The man who approached him moved with the quick easy, but somehow carefully studied movements of those rare individuals who combine great physical prowess alongside formidable intellectual power of one kind or another. 
Seleucus was honest enough with himself to admit that the king had a similar walk, at least as far as the monarch could be compared to any man, that there was probably more than one good cause for this resemblance he also well knew. The man came up to him and gave him a friendly greeting. The man in question was much smaller than Seleucus's seven feet. He had small, close-together eyes and a small mouth, a rather bulbous nose. His bearded face should not have been proposing, perhaps even sinister. But somehow he exuded a boyish charm. Then as now amongst men like him, he seemed to retain some of the energy and openness of early boyhood. For his part, as he beamed up at Seleucus, the man thought as he often had, he deserves his nickname, Oxhead. He looks just like a bad-tempered bull. But, as he always mentally added, never take him for a fool. Without any pretense at subtlety, angrily Seleucus began, Why, Ptolemy, am I and my men ordered north, when the king is to stay here, and then go with the rest of army into the Gerdosian desert? And where in Hades are the Agrianians? You know the hypospists always work alongside them. Asking me to operate in these conditions is like asking me to go about with one sandal on, and where are one hundred of my best officers? I can't find them anywhere. I am not well used, sir. I am treated as a foreign mercenary captain, not as one of the king's companions. Ptolemy shook his head in mildly mocking commiseration. You might as well get it all out, Seleucus. I can tell there's more, he said. As a matter of fact, there is more, retorted General Seleucus. He spat the next few words out with barely suppressed fury and venom. I am informed that I am to be under the command of Antigonus, one eye. I shall have to listen to that Cyclops as he gives endlessly forth on and on about his great victories, one on his independent secondment, the great satrap. Finally, after skulking up our own back trail, we are to turn west into the territory he governs, where we shall have the pleasure of seeing the locals kiss the ground before him. I am the commander of the Silver Shields the finest infantry in the world, but I would almost wish to see the 2,900 who remain with me, broken up into work parties who fetch and carry among the baggage trains, rather than endure these insults. Seleucus fell silent, a thunderous silence, his massive arms folded across his chest. After a thoughtful pause, Ptolemy quietly asked, Have you asked Perdiccas about all this? The two men suddenly exchanged a look and laughed. The mood instantly lifted. If there was mockery in the laughter, it was without any malice. Their old school fellow, Perdikas, had always been what we might now call an ever amicable class clown. He had always been full of schemes and escapades. These always went wrong. The passage of time had made them more amusing in memory than they had been for them as boys. Even the then Prince Alexander had allowed Perdiccas to direct him at times. Also, Perdiccas had long ago, and many times since, proved himself a formidable and brave warrior. Of course, I asked him, said Seleucus. He did as usual, made a lot of conciliatory noises. The short of it is, he obviously doesn't know, but didn't want to admit it. Anyway, Ptolemy, don't think I didn't see who you were just talking to. Get on with it, man. Ptolemy looked at him thoughtfully, then spoke. First, I'd like to talk to you, ask you what you think of this business here. Seleucus interrupted him. You talk more than a bloody Celt. Always have. Ptolemy ignored him and continued. The king's latest project, because it may have more bearing on what you've asked me than you might think. Seleucus snorted in disgusted mockery and skepticism, then sighed in resignation. Very well, then, he said tiredly. I also asked Perdiccas about this. In his opinion, it's just a royal whim. I see no reason to disagree. I've seen the plans for that thing, and I don't understand how he'll see anything anyway. Glass is cloudy, always is. Ptolemy interjected. Not this glass. It will be as clear as air. They tell me that it's not normal sand. There is crushed rock crystal in there. Supposedly, even ground diamonds. The fire is to burn with a fiery mountain's fierceness for two days. No such thing as ground diamonds. Impossible, said Seleucus. Seleucus continued, and the bottom of the thing is open. It will fill with water. Interesting, isn't it? Said Ptolemy with genuine enthusiasm. Apparently the trapped element air will keep the element water out. 
Of course, Alexander won't be able to stay in the deep ocean for very long. Men being mostly made of the element Earth, naturally breath that element out, thereby turning the element air into what the learned call dead air. That's what kills trapped miners and such. Seleucus looked at him levelly and cursed foully. Both men again laughed. Ptolemy continued. An iron frame is being constructed to enclose it. Also the walkway on which the king will stand. It will be lowered from between two ships. Some of the savants are calling it an ocean sphere. Others the diving bell. Because of the shape. I don't like the term diving bell, said Seleucus. It suggests something that won't come back up. Ptolemy told him he agreed. Hopefully it cracks in there, said Seleucid. After another short pause, Ptolemy continued. Naturally, an account of what the king sees will be taken down by the scribes and sent to Master Aristotle. Also, I believe a copy will be sent to young Master Euclid. Not, of course, in either case, the real account. He will keep those with him and give them with his own hands when the time comes. Seleucid rounded on him. He was immediately completely alert. What do you mean by real account? Also, though, I would expect our old teacher to get the report. Why a boy architect? Barely able to shave? Why? he demanded. Ptolemy didn't answer him. Instead, he drew from beneath his robe a scroll sealed with the royal sunburst. Here, General, are your real orders. Signed by the king himself. You are to read them. Then give this to Antigonus, one eye, when you are two days march north of here. You will be delighted to learn he knows nothing of this matter. You are instructed to detach your entire force from the northern column, plus one complete tax sila of the phalanx. Also, the entire force of our Cretan archers, all 2,000 of them, a force of almost 6,000 men. You are to return with them here. You are instructed to follow a circuitous route southeast. You are to set an easy pace and keep the men well fed and watered, so they arrive fresh. They will need all their strength. Seleucid snatched the scroll with undisguised eagerness, his eyes blazing. Then he started to laugh great bursts of mirth. He was so loud that several people in the clearing, including the king who gave an amused wave, turned and looked curiously. Ptolemy gave a polite, slightly pained chuckle. I'm so glad you're pleased, dear Seleucid. The king told me something of all this yesterday and just told me to come and give you that he pointed at the scroll in Seleucid's massive paw a few moments ago. Seleucid had regained enough of his composure to say, He doesn't know. This is delightful. His good eye will pop out. I can't wait to see his face. Then he fell silent. He stared intently at Ptolemy. In a low and deadly serious voice, he said, What in the name of all the hells is going on, man? Ptolemy was silent for at least a minute. Then he said, I am instructed to tell you that Alexander will come and see you himself this evening. He will explain everything. In the meantime, I am, so to speak, to prepare the way. But before I begin, I would like to ask you some question. Seleucid held up his hand and said in mock indignation, You're worse than that old Athenian rouge master Aristotle used to talk about. Just give me a straight answer, man. Socrates said to Ptolemy, if I must be compared to a common-born Athenian, many decades dead, then I could think of worse. Please indulge me. Seleucid sighed in resignation. Firstly, what do you think of the Indians? I mean in general? Seleucid considered briefly. They are, of course, just barbarians. And the Malians deserve what happened to them. But here are good fighters, brave, able, not just in the big kingdoms with cities, the jungle tribes have good armies, and you can do business with them. They have the common sense to keep treaties when it's in their best interest. Ptolemy nodded in agreement, then said, And I also admire people who live so far from the Middle Sea, who are our equals in the arts and sciences. Seleucus gave a snort, but also nodded. Ptolemy continued, I would say that between us we encapsulate the common opinion of the army. We think the Indians are barbarians, but we respect them. Between the two of us, we make a fine fellow who is wise in his generation. Another snort from Seleucid. Now, he continued, let me ask you another question. What do you think of the people who made formal submission two months ago? Who live over there? Ptolemy pointed to the northwest coast. 
to where one of the tributaries of the Indus broke of and enclosed an area of low coast and islands largely cut off on the northward side by huge swamps. A dubious broken belt of land and water, Seleucus hawked and spat, that for those people, dirty bastards, all stinking of fish, stupid, nasty, starring eyes looking at you without blinking, ugly, waddled necks like old women. It looked to me as if some of the catamites had webbed fingers. Just like peasants who go about their business with their cousins too much. Both men shuddered. Ptolemy continued. And you and I both have Indian mistresses. Would you take one of those people's woman in that role? The look on the other man's face was enough. Ptolemy shuddered again. Did you notice the other locals' reaction to those fine fellows? They walked out. Wouldn't look at them. Never mind talk to them. Only the other day, I asked a man the name of one of those islands. He told me, I can see no island, Lord. I don't think torture or treasure could have got him to acknowledge it was there. And talking of treasure, that was a lot of gold those devils brought in. Normally, Seleucid, you're like a dog after a heated bitch when it comes. The big man interrupted Ptolemy. As are you. As are we all. Only you would pretend the gold was for your fabled, never-to-be-built library. You might even be serious, he sneered amicably. Anyway, it wasn't the gold that put me off. I didn't like the work. All horrible fishes and squids, crowns and diadems made like they were for those wretches' narrow heads. It reminded me of... Here Seleucid fell silent. Ptolemy spoke for him. They reminded you of some of the pieces we found in Tyre in the old quarter when the city fell, and the dead children, they had been sacrificed. And you are also thinking of that thing that some of the men say came from the water and attacked the mole. The big man nodded. Also, said Ptolemy, did you notice there were no old gray beards present? It wasn't just disrespectful to the king. It's not the done thing round here. The Indians reverence old age. Where were their old men? Most of the ugly devils were younger than us. Seleucid looked at him thoughtfully, then said simply, What is going on? The king will tell you everything tonight. I am nearly finished. There is just one more thing he wanted me to say. Did you hear the story the couriers brought in about our old teacher? It seems that about a year and a half ago, Master Aristotle was walking with one old slave in the hills north of Pella. He, Seleucid interrupted him. He was on a bug hunt. Ptolemy rather winced at this interjection. He was collecting specimens for one of his natural histories. Though I admit to confusion here, the king having sent him so many wonders from far places. Anyway, be that as it may, they were set upon by robbers. They were, of course, completely helpless. But Master Aristotle knew what to do. With dangerous softness, Seleucid said, He told them who he was. Tell me, Ptolemy, did the brave band of cutthroats soil themselves when they learned the truth? Ptolemy said he was sure most of them had. Even after all we have done and seen, I will treasure the conversations I have had with that man all my life. I also know he helped you deal with your dancing letters affliction, Seleucid nodded. And as all the world know, Aristotle scribed out the copy of Homer the king keeps under his pillow at night. Aristotle is not so old. Now the king is married, he may soon expect a new pupil in a few years. May all the gods make it so. Anyway, one bold devil said they should just kill him anyway. Bury the body. Fortunately for Aristotle, he knew what to do. He told them people, in fact, did know the general direction and place he had been planning to go. Master Aristotle told them, The queen mother may not be over fond of me, but she will know what the king would wish. For your own sakes, you must not harm me or this man. Everything in this entire region will be destroyed. Trees, animals, men, women, children, all laid waste. A veil of desolation she will make of it, to such extent that a crow, flying across it, will have to carry his own provender. The robbers all turned tail and ran. I think I know the moral of this anecdote, Ptolemy, said Seleucus. This business... Whatever it is, is far more serious. It also touches upon what both our king and us are capable of, when necessary. Ptolemy nodded and said, far, far more serious. A battle is coming. The king will tell you against whom. 
By the way, why didn't you go to him yourself and ask him about why you were being sent north? Seleucid gave a snort. In the light of unfortunate recent events, when half the men think they are going into the Gadrosia Desert as punishment for what they did? Also, I don't have your advantage. I'm not his brother. And suddenly Ptolemy had drawn his sword. His face was contorted with focused, deadly rage. The sophisticated intellectual was gone. The point of the blade would have been at the other man's throat. Had he not leaped back, Panther fast and drawn his own blade. Be very careful, dear Seleucus. The king has many titles. He needs no new ones. And I do not need the invitation for the assassin's knife that one brings. Besides, you and I have been hearing that stupid story since we were boys. Deadly violence had come. It was never far from these men and their comrades. If they were soldiers whose doings would still be studied unimaginable years into the future, they were also the original robber barons who would one day almost destroy their own world. Suddenly the moment passed. It passed with the apparently inexplicable suddenness that it still does amongst proper soldiers, not trivial thugs. Laughingly, they embraced, slapped each other on the back. We mustn't fight Ptolemy. I would find it disturbing if we didn't quarrel, Seleucus. It would be disconcerting. I think it very likely two old men will be fighting still in ten, fifteen years' time. Who knows? Perhaps far from here? In that island north of the Pillars near what the geographers call Ultima Thule? Myself with a book in my hands. You will be criticizing the young men, telling them they don't know what they're doing. We will still be fighting. And Alexander will come and knock our heads together for us, as he always has, said Seleucus. As he always has, may it be ever so, said Ptolemy. No one had even noticed the altercation. In the clearing the king had, moments before, given the order, a great beehive-shaped mound of resin and oil-soaked wood and charcoal had been set alight. The heat and light were intense. Even now at midday, the slaves labored, throwing on more fuel. Flames roared skyward. Both men turned to look. Then Ptolemy prepared to take his leave. As he walked away, he turned suddenly and angrily said, It may be of interest for you to know. It is not you who is being sent away. You, great lump. It is I and my cavalry. Once more, Seleucid's laughter boomed out. He was now very happy. He stood once more at the center of things. Two. It is now two weeks later. Everything has been carefully prepared for what is about to happen. For many days, vast rafts of wood laden with huge boulders have been towed out by ships and left to float over a certain area about a mile and a half off the coast, then towed back again. Rumors, false ones, have been encouraged about them. For a month, hand-picked men have been disappearing from the army's units. These include the entire force of elite Agrianian skirmishers. That these men will be effectively lost to him on the day's main action is something the king is painfully aware of, but they have a vital task to perform. For days, this force has been deliberately moving back and forth across the back country, just south of the marshes that enclose a certain ill-regarded and dubious region of coast and islands. They have even camped there. All this has been done in full view of the squalid, fish-reeking towns and villages. The soldiers have committed no violence on his personal orders. Three miles east of that area on a clifftop headland, he has deployed the main force. Of necessity, a worryingly small one. Here the cliffs rise 50 sheer feet above the ocean. They sweep away gradually over a large swath of open ground, down to a wide sandy beach, fringed by jungle. It is here that the king knows his enemy will come ashore. Everything has been done to deceive this enemy. Those who are watching from the shore in the islands, and more importantly, those who he knows are watching from below. Ever since the Indian holy man told him things that only the oracle of Ammon had said, the holy man who had also walked into a pyre to his own immolation, to prove what else he said was also true, he has been preparing for this day. The man had said, now is the turn of the tide. They will soon be ready, Alexander of Macedon. Soon they will sweep up the river and polluted will be the blood of men and women. Then outwards and along the coast, all the world will fall. You cannot control more of the world than you stand on. But stopping this evil is a worthy job of work. You are the only one who can do it. 
Perhaps you have not come here in vain ambition. Now is the day. The royal grooms have a horse ready for the king on the edge of the beach. Some time ago he has gone up to the animal and whispered in his ear these words. Bucephalus should be here, but he is gone. Yet I know you will not fail me. Good and loyal friend, incapable of betrayal and corruption. I know you, like all wholesome beasts, would wish to flee from or kill those who are coming. But you must be calm, calm, patient. He had gently patted the animal's neck and turned away. The king is rowed out by two sailors in a small boat. Ahead of them are two huge, many-oared triremes, the diving bell suspended in the air by chains and a wooden frame between them. It is indeed almost as clear as air, enclosed by mighty iron bands. A rope ladder descends from inside it. The ships are anchored just behind where the huge boulder-laden rafts float with mute but somehow ominous intent. The two vessels are also attached to long ropes. It may be necessary for the work parties on the shore to pull them in very quickly. The king is in full armor, fully armed. He wears the breastplate of Achilles. On his head a small iron helmet. Over this, the lion headdress. A proper European lion, the ones from the highlands back home, who the hunters say are becoming rare these days. This is all a calculated risk. Should the enemy reach the ocean sphere, they may drag him into the water. He will sink like a stone, yet he wants to be seen. So the calculated risk is taken. It is dawn. Full light is coming quickly. This is very necessary. Almost casually, he turns and looks northwest. At first there is nothing. Then faintly carried on the breeze from far away, the sounds of screams, shouts. The first traces of smoke begin to rise. The noises become louder, the smoke thicker. The king smiles grimly. He tells the sailors to row him over to the waiting ships. When he reaches the bell, he quietly orders, pointing at the rafts, burn them. Soon smoke is rising from the huge rafts. The timber has all been well soaked in oil and pitch. He waits for a few minutes, then climbs up the ladder into the bell. Just before entering it, he reaches and absently touches something that glitters on one of the iron bars. The bell is lowered into the ocean. As always, he has thought carefully about the enemy. These foes are particularly powerful and old. Old. He thinks they may be full of pride. Pride that is even huger than they themselves suspect. Built up over centuries, layer on layer. Even as pearls are formed within oysters near their homes. He has calculated that it might be possible to goad them into rash action. He hopes he is right. If not, a disaster will occur. Hence this part of the plan. At first he can see nothing in the gloom, then a shoal of fish swim past the bell. Above the sun has risen higher, and as the light increases and his eyes grow used to the watery murk, he sees that which he has come here to see. The sight almost seems to loom into view, a vast panorama of cyclopean, eternally soaked blocks of worked stone. It disappears, unending into the ocean. Even the huge buildings themselves are an offense to the eyes, to sanity. Vast vistas of stone whose angles look all wrong. Walls that seem to rear threateningly, yet which in the very same instant to retreat and slink away sinisterly, all dripping with seaweed and slime, and everywhere the carvings, fish, whales, octopus, nameless marine things. And then there are the worst carvings of all, the images of those who have raised and who dwell in this evil place, neither fish nor man a guild-scaled travesty of them both, and even worse things. Huge statues of the monsters these monster worship in turn. Here and there, the movements of a few of the living embodiments of these abominations. The city is called many-pillared Yuthgatharun, sometimes also Yuthgatharun in the depths. The king sees other movements and smiles again in more grim satisfaction. Above him, one of the rafts has collapsed, and the huge boulders crash into the sea. They fall with deceptive slowness, cushioned by the water. Then they begin to crash into the buildings, doing terrible destruction on the ancient worked stones. He sees a sunken colonnaded avenue collapse under one impact, a strange leaning tower all festooned with a forest of seaweed falls. All around the stones begin to fall. Alexander looks across a great plaza, sunken under the water since the world was young. 
They're on a pillar squatting for untold centuries a statue. Squid head and wings, a huge stone shears half the head away. From the buildings they begin to pour in huge numbers. He knows this is only a suburb of the city. He also knows the attack on their outpost on land has lured most of them away, or hopes it has. Now the time has come for the final part of the beginning of the plan. The holy man had told him, in their sunken city, they talk to one another with their minds. What one knows they all know. He will now use this against them. Some of them are looking up. All is chaos and confusion. Amongst the stones are heavy metal spears, double-weighted at the ends, so they fall point downwards. Already some have found their marks. The king is silhouetted clearly. He gives those below a mocking wave. Then he stoops and holds aloft two large tablets of gold. These form a single square that fits cunningly together. He casts these into the water. Several hateful shapes swim to retrieve them. Then it is as if the ocean floor had arisen. From the weed-chalked floor in the buildings, they begin to rise. Tens of thousands strong. They do not even appear to swim upwards. With barely perceptible movements of webbed, clawed hands and feet, they soar through the water. A living whirlpool of horror up towards the glass bell which is already rising to escape them, the king having pulled a signal rope. Then suddenly the hideous swimmers pause. One of them has taken up the gold tablets and is reading the short message, written in several tongues of men. Little fishes, greetings. Know that it was I, Alexander of Macedon, third of my name, lord of the world, who has done this to you. It was my men who have slain your half-human gets on the shore, like the vermin they were. I have had all the Shoggoths killed in the stables where you had put them to harden them for use on land. How sad it is that little fishes are so weak and decadent in these modern times that they could breed and control so very few. No, it was I who rained destruction down on youth Gatharin. I am sick with joy when I think of what I have done. My only regret is that I cannot at this happy time drag Father Dagon and Mother Hydra ashore to lie dead and rotting a feast for the birds. To long have these foul demons usurp Poseidon's kingdom. Little fishes are not to come on land anymore. After today, if they do, I will have them staked out on the ground under the hot sun. Salt and red-hot sand will be poured into their gills and eyes. This is more than they deserve. If they had one head, I would cut it off. This would be a kindness. I know what the third oath of Dagon is. I know how they forced many of the brave Indians to take it. The fate of the men and boys is terrible as the women and girls. Little fishes will say that they are numberless, that they live forever and can never be destroyed, that they are the keepers of secrets immemorial. I say yes, yes, and yes again. It must be very wearisome for little fishes in their sunken octopus shit befouled hovel. But I am generous. I and my soldiers will be waiting to give them the gift of death. But they must be patient. There are very few of us, as most of my men are away on more important business. I am told that little fishes might not come because they are afraid of the sun. They must not tarry. Soon we will be away into the scorching desert where little fishes can't go. It might also occur to them to take cruel, unjust vengeance on the new city or the local people. If they do this, I will return and roof the sea above with ships. They will feel the tramp of the host I shall bring far out in the ocean. Alexander. They all now knew the message. Such was their rage that the sea seemed to boil around them. As they slashed at it viciously, they began to swim toward the shore. Above on one of the ships, the king said, Take us to land. The deep ones are coming. 3. His greatest fear had been that they would treat the affair like a gigantic siege, come up on land and destroy everything for miles around, whilst avoiding his main body, then attack under cover of night. That would bring catastrophe. He now had no need to worry. Not only had he already horribly damaged them, although in the vast scheme of things, it was all in truth a mere pinprick. He had mocked them. This was something new and intolerable. They were the dreaded ones. Little fishes, the ones the humans only mentioned in fearful, trembling whispers, those whose glorious victory, sunken hovel, was inevitable and preordained by the true gods. 
They who would reach out for men and women with their reeking talons and do as they would with them. Staked out. The Deep One's rage was indescribable. Monumental. They will kill all his men in front of him, and then take the human king into the ocean. They will half drown him a dozen times, pass him around between them before they kill him. They planned to use cunning arts to preserve his body and face for all time. There was a certain carven pillar far away in the deep fastness of the water. They would bind him upside down to this, and then, for all time, come and mock and slobber into his face on the anniversary of this day, down in the eternal dark depths of Father Dagon and Mother Hydra. Now as the ships neared the shore, Alexander has another fear. Outwardly he was completely calm. Within his mind this thought repeated itself endlessly. What have I done? He remembers how numberless they are. He is glad he has ordered the raiding parties to quickly retreat after the attack on the coast is over. The enemy are as endless as their home. Never in a million years would he let anyone know his thoughts. In any case, it is now too late. The diving bell, its purpose done, has been cut away and cast into the water. The ships are now beached, half dragged out the sea. The men all do as they have been instructed. They flee at top speed back into the jungle. The king calmly rides his horse along the water's edge, so he is slightly nearer to where the cliffs rise. He moves closer to where the sand ends and the first of the dunes begin. Then he turns the horse and looks calmly out oceanward. At first there are only the steady movement and beat of the waves. But then other movements, just under the surface, vague shapes. Then a clawed webbed hand breaks the surface. Here a flash of sickly fish belly whiteness as one of them rolls over in the surf. There a hideous green scaled spine back. The deep ones are gathering, massing. Soon Alexander will know if he and his men have even the slightest chance of surviving the day and he will give his enemy one final provocation. They do not simply emerge from the waves. They pour out, are vomited forth. Tens and tens of thousands of fish frog devils, who are more hideous because they resemble human beings in shape, pouting flabby lips, great bulging, unblinking eyes, ever gasping gills. Many grasp swords, spears, long tridents with vicious barbed tips, some even have shields emblazoned with unspeakable images. They and their half-human mutant spawn have not been idle. A heaving, croaking mass of unspeakable beings. The stench of them is itself abominable. Some of them are blinded by the light and stumble, floundering. They are crushed underfoot without mercy by their own fellows. The living tidal waves rolls up and outwards, dripping in water and slime. Then they see him. Up the beach, the human king. He is alone, and he gives the Deep Ones a friendly wave. He waves at them, the immortal and terrible mer beings. He dares to do this. He with his short may fly life and his lungs that can only choke on water. And as they look, he turns and shows them his back in the horse's tail. They are insane with the rage, apoplectic. They let forth a screech of anger that is almost more insectile than ichthyoid. They charge, some dropping to all fours. Up the beach, the horse has been held in place by a force that had someone been nearby they would have perhaps felt physically. This was, of course, the king's will. He leans forwards and whispers in the animal's ear, Run! The stallion, still more a hardy little pony than like a modern horse, is immediately galloping in a way. He does not need his rider to even guide him. He knows where to go. Up and away across the slopes to the cliffs. Their terrible pursuers are 200 yards behind them, some even nearer, and they are gaining ground. The king has been perfectly aware that he is still too incapacitated by his wound to fight for long on horseback, let alone on foot. So, as he said to Seleucus the day before, to catch fish you use live bait. And atop the cliff in a vast open space a fortress stood. It is a fortress of armored and armed men, 16,000 strong, its left face along the sheer cliff is completely open. At the four corners, hundreds strong, the silver shields. Seleucus himself is standing at the most exposed point, the apex of the south-facing landward corner. He and his men are in full heavy armor, like that of Leonidas and his men at the pass all those years before. He has had them discard their stabbing spears. 
This will be sword work. The night before, he told them, we are going to gut some fish, and there was laughter. Along most of the formation ripple the long, upright Sarasa pikes, each 16 feet long, all topped by the small, sturdy points the Romans will one day refer to as little teeth. They can punch through shields, armor, flesh, and bone. The soldiers are all grizzled, experienced veterans. Each 15 rank, deep face of the square is not the clumsy, unwieldy mass of the successors that the legions will one day fight. Last night, the king deliberately walked past the camp of the unit that now forms the southern face, that which will now face the first full impact of the enemy. General Seleucus had happened to be with him. Alexander had casually remarked to some of the men, I am going to stay just behind you tomorrow, on my horse's back. I will not move. So tomorrow you are the royal guard, not this fellow. And he had, with equal offhandedness, lightly cuffed the general's ears before putting his hand on the big man's shoulder. The king had stumbled slightly and Seleucid steadied him. The king thanked him, then he winked at the men. Seleucid roared out that if this was the case, he would stand the men, all the wine they could drink, and give them gold from his own purse, as they would be in his employ. Cheering erupted, but some of the men, those who had also served the king's father, had wept unashamedly. Lower lips trembling, the tears coursing down their scarred, weather-beaten faces. Now today they would have stood and fought, even without armor and weapons, and died in place. These moments were, of course, the real seeds of legend. Just behind the heavy infantry, another gapped square of wagons. Atop these and between them stand the brave men of Crete, with their deadly composite bows. These resemble slightly flattened letter M's. Many of these men could perform the bullseye kills, Paint an eye on an apple, set the target up at maximum range, then put three arrows through it at once, so that the fruit exploded. They were the finest archers in the world, as well as formidable infantry fighters. Behind them are the ballistae and catapults. Finally, an inner area. Food, water, spare arrows. The king has had to make the deception real. He knows the deep ones have fully human traitors as agents. Much of the army has truly gone, even with the men Seleucus brought in two days before the force is very small. Now he has gambled everything, and the enemy are here in endless numbers. The soldiers see the horse and rider, his monstrous pursuers, the thunderous clash of spear and sword on shields, a deep-throated roar. They cry out, The king! The king! Our king! The horse, eyes rolling, charges towards the southern face of the square. Just when a collision seems inevitable, several of the files of men step neatly to the side. The fortress receives its master and neatly closes again. Alexander rides the horse to the top of a small mound of packed earth a few feet high, which has been created for this purpose, turns, draws, and raises his sword and looks over his men's heads. The first of the fishmen are less than 50 yards away. They fill the slope tens on tens of thousands. More and more still pour from the ocean. The deep ones are nearer. For agonizing moments, the sword remains raised. Raised. The sword slashes down. Screaming at the top of their lungs, the officers yell, Drop! 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 The southern face of the phalanx throws themselves flat. Prone. And the catapults, ballista, and archers let loose a storm. It does not so much hit the deep ones as smash them, smite them. They drop dead in hundreds, thousands. They are thrown into the air under the impacts. The stones rake furrows of destruction through them, then continue bouncing and recoiling down the hill to claim more. The ballista bolts pass through them, bodies torn, pierced, hideous broken dolls with vermilion wounds. The heavy siege engines are slowly being reloaded. The arrow storm is unabated. The Cretans take to aiming deliberately for the hateful, unblinking eyes. The entire horde seems to writhe and recoil on and into itself, as if a single living thing. For a moment it resembles a broken snake, one that has crawled to near a peasant woman's door and been hit with a heavy stick. For precious moments the Gilmen's advance up the slope is halted, then screaming and croaking in hatred they sweep up and on and the officers on the great square's southern face are shouting frantically, manically, 
Up, up, up! The men rise smoothly to their feet, pikes in hand. Incredibly, they still hold the Sarissas upright, at rest. The enemy have surged on over their dead. The archers are now firing over their own men's heads. When the deep ones are almost on them, the officers cry one word. Couch! The first five ranks bring the pikes sweeping down. Impact. The fishmen are impaled by their own momentum on the little teeth. As in any human activity, there are tricks to what these men do. Not immediately clear to the uninitiated, the weapon is swung in a narrow foot or foot and a half arc from side to side with the entire body. The weapon is so long that the forward stab is delivered more with the body and legs. It is vital not to fall into rhythm with the men near you. Forgetting any of this was beaten out of them in basic training, and that was long ago. And then there is the most important, most deadly trick of all. The arms are kept locked in place. It's a waste of time and energy to do otherwise. Until the little tooth bites, then must come the twist and back pull. Delivered with the arms and wrist, it must be done instantly, without thought. It is a murdering by itself. To even touch the pikes, even without being stabbed, is dangerous. The cornell wood is very strong, but has some give. To run against it is like hitting the bristles of a huge brush. Most of the veterans have stories about enemies blasted out of their own sandals. The enemy once more recoils, or rather tries to. Those behind push those in front forwards to die. Then the deep ones surge on. They surround the entire fortress of men. There is battle along its entire length. The noise is indescribable. Once, twice, six, finally seven times the Deep Ones surge forwards and are thrown back. Their demonic faces are ghastly, twisted with rage. Fat, pouting, flabby lips pulled back from their sharp fish-like teeth. Worse still are the bulging, expressionless eyes. It was on the seventh attack that Seleucus struck. He and his men have already done tremendous execution. The machete, like one, edge-pointed copus swords, shearing of arms and heads. Now he and one hundred of his best men charge out into the horde, the missile troops concentrating their aim on the small force's flanks. The general is in the lead, roaring in exultation. He cuts the fishmen down, slices through them like a boy playing with a switch who knocks down weeds. Then the fighting retreat to the square. The general and forty of the men make it back. This marks the end of the mass attacks and effectively the first part of the battle. Now the deep ones start to throw missiles, their own weapons, stones, even their own hideous dead. They are immensely strong and the men begin to die. In ones and twos they are wounded and killed. Here a calamity occurs the king had not foreseen. The fish men smash apart the two ships and use the broken pieces as more ammunition. They also start to attack the square's southern face continually. Here they concentrate those of their host who have shields. Against the other faces, they make short rushes. A few thousand there, a hundred here. Alexander has observed all this, part of him with detached interest, even in the dire situation. Even as he moved units and gave orders, he thinks to himself, sound moves, keep most of the force pinned down, attack the men who are most tired, support it all with missiles. They are not mindless monsters, and they learn quickly. He glances down the slope and sees a small group of the enemy standing on a rocky outcrop, arms raised. They all appear to be gazing out to sea. It looks as if they have things on their heads. Almost instinctively, he thinks to himself, priests. Then he and many of the men look over across at the ocean. It has grown dark. The deep ones have all drawn back, and they are making a new noise. It is horrible and unmistakably laughter. Now it is the monster's turn to point with mockery. For from the ocean, black twisting tendrils of nebulous darkness are rising. These are forming black clouds on the sky. Distantly, thunder rumbles. And as the men look on with horror, they begin to move toward the land, against the wind. Then when the sun is blotted out under cover of heavy rain, they will come, and the day will be lost. For Father Dagon and Mother Hydra have come to aid their children. The men are still defiant covered in blood and sweat, all bowed down with exhaustion. They will fight to the end, but still the mocking inhuman laughter continues. Then a single horn gives a blast, and on the deep ones left in landward flank, horsemen appear. 
They sit their horses with such ease it is as if the centaurs have come. Long lances and swords, these men would have considered stirrups and spurs cowards' devices. In a great wedge they emerge from the forest Ptolemy at their head. On their flanks swarm out hosts of horse archers, and still distant the clash of pike on shield. Infantry reinforcements. In those days when the West was young, many men were still near to things most of us now cannot see. Even as the king's embattled men cried out, The companions! The companion cavalry! Zeus, save us! They said they saw strange shapes in the sky. Nebulous and indistinct, it was as if the king's elite cavalry force cast the shadows of other horses and men into the sky. The deep ones all saw. Their alien minds understood with perfect clarity. They understood that these were the shades of human horsemen yet unborn. Who would indeed one day be the shadows of the real men who had come upon them? Here were Arthur and his cataphracts, who had driven his enemy back with such courage that the children of his foes would one day revere his memory. There, the Frankish knights who charged at Montigsard against terrible odds, led by a young boy who already had the first marks of the terrible disease that would one day take his life on his face. Here, the Polish hussars who would save a city called Vienna. Frederick's horsemen, run, run, as fast as you can. Save yourself, you cannot stand. The Scots graze at Waterloo, who when they passed through the Highland infantry, the men hung from the stirrups and were carried howling with joy into the enemy. Many others. The king cried out in his battle voice, I command you, ride them down, kill them all. Already the ghostly host had spurned the land for the ocean. All the priests of Dagon on the rock cried out once in despair and fell dead. The dark clouds shredded were gone. The deep ones broke. Their only thought to escape the terrible human king who had brought red catastrophe down on them. Even as the cavalry crashed into them, they were fleeing for the cliffs. If they could escape into the water, they would be safe. Hear the final trap. The tide has turned. They fall into very shallow water and very hard, sharp rocks. The waves turn red. The very ocean has been used against them. Ptolemy rides his cavalry almost to the brink, then wheels to the right and down the slope. The men roar in triumph. The battered square is moving unstoppably down the hill. The day had been decided. Epilogue. But although his own kind spurned him when he was old, the people loved and respected him. And one day a villager brought the old man in the faded red coat, a beautiful broken piece of ancient glass from where it lay by the shore, a rusted iron band so broken and thin it was almost gone, and written on a tiny gold plate, Alexander of Macedon had me made.